Good morning, afternoon, and evening. Thank you all for joining today's webinar to learn more about effective governance for nutrition programming. My name is Katie Appel, and I'm an assistant researcher for the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Nutrition, and will be your MC for this webinar today. As attendees are joining, I'll begin by going over some housekeeping items. I'd like to direct all attendees to a few functions on this Zoom webinar. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a chat icon and a Q&A icon. Use the chat feature to engage in relevant conversation with other attendees. If you have questions for one of the panelists, please use the Q&A feature. Panelists will respond to questions in the Q&A box throughout the webinar, and we've allotted the final 20 minutes of this webinar for Q&A. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties, send a message in the chat box to all panelists so that our technical support staff can work with you to resolve them. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Innovation Lab Innovation Lab for Nutrition website and the USAID Advancing Nutrition website. There you can also register for upcoming webinars and view recordings and slide decks of previous webinars. We will repeat these technical housekeeping items in the chat throughout the webinar as people may join at later times. The moderator for this webinar today is Dr. Robin Tressa, the Regional Pro Project Manager for the Nutrition Innovation Lab. Dr. Shrestha received his Master's of Science in Food Policy and Applied Nutrition at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University, and has a degree in medicine with eight years of clinical experience in rural settings of Nepal. He currently oversees and supports the Nutrition Innovation Lab's research and capacity building activities in Asia and Africa. Dr. Shrestha will begin by providing a brief description of the Nutrition Innovation Lab before introducing the panelists for today's webinar. Dr. Shrestha, over to you. Thank you, Katie. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this exciting second webinar of the uh, second edition of our webinar series. Before I go into introducing the topic and our speakers for today, uh, let me give a brief introduction to the Nutrition Innovation Lab and talk a little about our webinar series. We are the Feed the Future Innovation Lab, supported by the USA Bureau of Resilience and Food Security, and active in supporting research and capacity building to build the evidence base around critical questions linked to agriculture, nutrition, and health. And as you can see from this map here, we are active in both Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And you can get more information uh, on our website about our activities and, and any uh, activities related publications and articles on our website at nutritioninnovationlab.org. Uh, Next slide, please. Thank you. Next slide, please. Yeah. <clears throat> So to do all of this work, we have a consortium led by the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University uh, with US partners, including Purdue, Harvard, uh, Johns Hopkins, and Tuskegee. Uh, in addition, we have partnered and extensively engaged with uh, government agencies in our host countries, UN agencies, uh, local and international NGOs, as well as universities across the globe. Next slide, please. So uh, for today's webinar, uh, it focuses on the governance around nutrition, as the title suggests, and we will explore novel strategies for measuring nutrition governance in the, in the context of Ethiopia and Nepal. Today's webinar includes presentation by Professor Dr. Eileen Kennedy, Dr. Sivani Ghosh, and, and Ms. Grace Namirembe. Uh, Professor Kennedy will be presenting findings from Ethiopia that were conducted as part of the U.S. Engine and Growth Through Nutrition Project, while Dr. Ghosh and Ms. Namirembe will present on findings from Nepal. Uh, both studies examine governance around nutrition and while separate projects were linked intellectually around a common uh, set of goals and, and objectives. As for our speakers, Dr. Eileen Kennedy is a former Dean of the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University. Dr. Kennedy is a professor at the school and her research interests include assessing the health, nutrition, diet, and uh, food security impacts of policies and program, nutrition density, nutrient density, and, and diet diversity, and agriculture nutrition linkages. She has been a member of the high-level panel of experts on food security and nutrition of the UN Committee on World Food Security, and a member of the UNSCN Advisory Group on Nutrition. She founded and was the first executive director of the USDA Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion. She created the Healthy Eating Index, which is used as a single summary measure of diet quality. 
Dr. Sivani Ghosh is a research associate professor at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. She is also the associate director for the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Nutrition with experience working in the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South Asia. Her research interests are in understanding the role of agriculture in improving nutrition while ensuring health, assessing the diet and non-diet determinants of nutritional status of infant and young children, and testing interventions aimed at improving maternal and infant uh, nutrition and growth. Ms. Grace Namirembe, who is a data analyst at Nutrition Innovation Lab since 2015, uh, completed her Master of Public Health with special interest in epidemiology and biostatistics at Boston University, and has been working on multi-country projects, including projects in Nepal. And her primary interests are around the Nutrition Governance Index. So uh, I will now pass it over to Dr. Kennedy, who will begin uh, today's presentation. Over to you, Eileen. Thank you, Robin. The title of my presentation, Nutrition Policy and Governance in Ethiopia, What Difference Does Five Years Make? derives from a paper <clears throat> a group of us published last year, uh, 2020, in the Food Nutrition Bulletin. If I could have the next slide. And uh, I want to acknowledge, of course, the, the uh, substantial help from colleagues at the Ethiopian Public Health Institute Save the Children Ethiopia and a range of my colleagues at Tufts University. Um, you'll be hearing after me from Dr. Shabani Ghosh uh, on some Nepal work. And I'd like to emphasize here that the protocols we use for Ethiopia and Nepal for this work were similar, not identical, but similar. And so there's some synergy there. Next slide, please. Um, some background which led up uh, to the work and I'll start with the scaling up nutrition movement, the launch of which was in 2010. I was invited to the official launch, which took place in New York City at the UN General Assembly meetings because I was part of a planning group that had input into the structure of SUN. Uh, it was a very positive event, given enormous visibility because it was uh, chaired by then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. So great visibility. And Secretary Clinton was very clear uh, that we know a lot and referred to as an example, the Lancet series, uh, which emphasized a multi-sectoral approach to dealing with nutrition, to dealing with the sustainable development goals. And so a multi-sectoral approach uh, combining nutrition sensitive and nutrition specific interventions and what I'd like to emphasize from the Sun Movement is the fact that it is the expression that's used country owned, meaning the, the countries who participate in Sun have to feel as though it reflects their priorities. And I think that's important. Uh, both Ethiopia and Nepal were designated early riser countries, meaning they participated in Sun very early on. If I could have the next slide. And prior to Sun ever existing, uh, Ethiopia uh, had already expressed a commitment to nutrition as evidenced by a national nutrition strategy, which was developed in January 2008. Uh, the first national nutrition program, which spanned the period 2008 to 2015, <clears throat> second national uh, nutrition program spanning the period 2016 and 2020. Um, in 2018, we had the uh, National Food and Nutrition Policy, and there continues to be a lot of high level um, documents coming out which reinforce the commitment to nutrition. If I could have the next slide, please. And so two US AID funded projects are the basis of my presentation today. One is the ENGINE project, and that acronym stands for Empowering New Generations to Improve Nutrition and Economic Opportunities. Um, we covered the period 2011 to 2016. And again, I'd like to emphasize that Dr. Ghosh was one of the co-investigators on this. And then Growth Through Nutrition, uh, which covered the period 2016 to 2021. Both ENGINE and Growth Through Nutrition um, stressed a multi-sectoral approach to improving health and nutrition with a specific focus on what's called the first thousand days, uh, i.e. pregnant women and children up to age two. 
uh, in the, no, please, please go back. Um, <clears throat> in the spirit of um, uh, a country owned process, very early on, we became involved in Engine, we being Tufts in October 2012, no, sorry, October 2011 which was the, uh, the first launch of engine in Ethiopia. And very soon afterwards in March, 2012, there was a workshop convened by Tufts, a two day workshop to begin to define the research priorities that should uh, really be the focus of engine. And I, I think, I genuinely believe this was a very critical workshop. Again, Shabani and I were both involved in this, a critical workshop because Importantly, representatives from uh, various parts of Ethiopian government, as well as other stakeholders, uh, very intimately involved in defining the research agenda. And the emphasis was on uh, applied research, implementation research. And what I remember, and there's certain things that stick in one's mind, what I remember about that 2012 uh, workshop I was chairing the uh, group thinking about defining what um, our nutrition governance research should be. Um, and I'm always reminded that we use terms like enabling environment, good governance, uh, assuming everybody knows what those terms mean or everyone has the same um, definition expectation. And at, at this workshop in Addis, um, we began the workshop and somebody threw out a question, um, what is good governance? And directly across from me in my eyesight was a, a representative of an international organization. And uh, the response from this person was good governance is what we say it is. I hope that was a joke. Uh, if it wasn't, um, there's a concern there. But they, that sparked a really good conversation, sort of lightened the mood in a way, sparked a really good conversation on what do we mean by good governance? I, and that morphed into, for our engine governance work, morphed into what we should be doing collectively. And really the, the um, underlying themes there is since the multi-sectoral approach to nutrition was fairly new in Ethiopia, um, uh, what are the facilitators and constraints to implementing a fairly new approach to dealing with nutrition? If I could have the next slide. So the two studies used a similar engine and growth to nutrition, similar approach, semi-quantitative structured interviews with key informants, and they were chosen because they represented the organization, not uh, uh, the individuals per se. Fortunately, both studies were conducted in the same four regions of uh, Ethiopia, Amhara, Aromia, Tigray, and SNNP. Next slide, please. And first of all, we were interested in what key stakeholders saw as the major nutrition problem or problems in Ethiopia, because if you don't see something as a problem, you're unlikely to address it. Very clear from this uh, bar graph in the four regions, malnutrition was seen as the dominant problem. And for people who were more expansive in their response and didn't say simply malnutrition, but uh, provided more context, stunting dominated the answer here. And I don't find this surprising because there had been a very significant workshop uh, not uh, too far in the distant past where stunting was the focus. So I think there was a flavor of that that came through in this response to major nutrition problem. Next slide, please. So again, if people don't feel engaged in activities, uh, it's unlikely to be successful governance. So a key question in engine was, do you feel that your office department is consulted on nutrition issues. And I, from my point of view, this is a busy slide, but let's look at uh, the column that talks about percent consulted. What jumps out at me in the four regions is that the percent of individuals from the health se sector and the percent of individuals from the partner sector uh, dwarfs any other group. So clearly health center representatives and partner representatives felt included in the nutrition issues. Uh, and what we're gonna see over the next few slides is that early on in this multi-sexual approach, there was the sense 
there was the sense that this was a very health oriented approach to nutrition. Next slide, please. Similarly, do you feel there is sufficient attention resources focused on nutrition? And I, I circled T gray here as an example uh, where we see health 100% of those in that region felt there were significant resources as opposed to a much smaller percentage of um, other individuals in other sectors feeling sufficient attention uh, focused on nutrition. And I, again, I circle here some of the partners who felt uh, very uh, more engaged. If you go to Oromia, the, the third uh, region down, the health sector felt less engaged and we were never clear why that is. But in general, in the early stages of the uh, National Nutrition uh, Program, it tended to skew in the direction of the health sector and health colleagues being feeling more engaged. If I could have the next slide, please. Uh, in addition to our semi-quantitative uh, protocol, we also had a series of focus groups. And I use just these two quotes. There are many, many, many others that uh, convey a similar point of view. First, quote, in my opinion, nutrition receives sufficient attention and enough resources are allocated to implementing nutrition programs as the uh, economy of the country allows. And this is from somebody, a respondent in Amhara of uh, the Warada Health Bureau, as opposed to an alternative quote, which gives a different impression, Inten attention is not given in terms of budget and manpower. Nutrition issue is only performed by the health center. This comes out of the same region, I'm horror, but somebody representing the regional bureau. Next slide, please. Um, government resources prioritized, not surprisingly given that uh, Ethiopia uh, is, was and still is an agriculturally based economy, agriculture, from the point of view of resources dominated the perception of resources, but then you go to second priority and basically across the four regions, you see competition second priority between allocation of resources to health and education. Next slide, please. Knowledge of the national nutrition strategy. And again, this was fairly early on in the history of the strategy. Uh, I circle here in the four regions partners and what you see there and ask, do you know the national nutrition strategy? Overwhelmingly, the partner sector did. And that's not surprising. Representatives of different partners were actively involved in helping, in, in advising, in discussing uh, the essence of the national nutrition strategy with representatives of the government of Ethiopia. And many of the partners were also very generous in providing funding to implement the national nutrition strategy. And if you look at other sectors, I mean, take Tigray, at that point, only 14% of those, for example, in the health sector uh, had knowledge of the national nutrition strategy. Next slide, please. Okay, major challenges during implementation. Uh, I, uh, I picked this particular slide because I think sometimes we think of regions and war raiders within regions as very homogeneous. This is not true. And for example, major challenges in implementation we see here in Tigray and SNPR that a low awareness of nutrition in general of the strategy was the key challenge during implementation. Whereas in uh, Oromia, we see uh, lack of attention, low awareness of nutrition and coordination problems equally represented as a challenge during implementation. Different in Amhara where budget and lack of attention to nutrition were seen as the most significant challenges. If I could have the next slide, please. Okay, so uh, I break it down again, not simply here by region, but by major challenges in collaboration and coordination by regions and yes, by sectors. And what we see here is what has been reflected in some of the other uh, data that the challenges in collaboration and coordination not only vary a bit by region, 
but more so by sectors within the region. And so let's take Amhara again. Uh, if you look at the uh, health sector, they saw a lack of attention to nutrition as one of the major challenges in collaboration. Whereas the economic sector, 39% of the respondents saw a budget shortage uh, as the key challenge. The social sector represented saw low awareness in sectors of nutrition. And I think if we, again, if we had more time and looked at uh, comments, individual comments from focus groups, to a certain extent, the economic and social sectors felt a bit, a bit disenfranchised in the early days of the launch of the Nutrition Strategy and Nutrition Program. One, um, partners and uh, that zero uh, percentage there in, in several, in, in Amhara and Tigray is not a mistake. We went back several times to make sure that the analysis was correct. The partners, at least in those regions, Amhara and Tigray didn't particularly find many challenges. They thought it was gonna be a seamless transition to implementation, but again, the concerns vary across um, regions and within regions, the different sectors. I will say, because of a lot of the very lively discussions that occurred both at the national government level and subnational, and uh, we in our research were engaged in some of that, one of the ways that this research uh, influenced changes in the governance, and I, I would be presumptuous to assume that our research was the only factor, but we did spend a good lot of uh, amount of time with Save the Children, with our, our colleagues in government, uh, in agencies, ministries, and um, uh, government of Ethiopia in uh, dissemination events. And between Engine and what I'm gonna talk about now, Growth Through Nutrition, the oversight of the uh, national nutrition programs, and this was one of the recommendations out of our research, the oversight uh, was elevated to the office of the prime minister. And this immediately sent the signal that this in fact involved all sectors. It was not simply a um, health center, multi-sectoral initiative, but all sectors needed to be involved. If I could have the next slide, please. Now the, the growth through nutrition project benefited from uh, the experience of ENGINE. And in year four of ENGINE, a change was made whereas where WARADAs were selected to serve in three capacities. First of all, uh, model war raters, models of multi-sectoral coordination of nutrition. Not surprisingly, we call these model, model war raters, there were four. And the model war raters were based on receiving a full package of interventions, livelihood, WASH, uh, SBCC. Equally important, there had to be a commitment at the uh, level of the war raters, uh, the commitment of leaders to implementation of the National Nutrition Program. And the uh, growth through nutrition supported the establishment of multi-sectoral coordination bodies, frequent technical assistance, financial support, um, what they call supportive supervision, usually monthly. And just to highlight here that sometimes uh, people refer to growth through nutrition as engine two. Wasn't quite that because again, based on what we learned from engine, there were some differences. For example, the WASH component of growth through nutrition was much more significant than it was under ENGINE. So four model war raters, and then we had four non-model war raters. They received some support from growth through nutrition, but not the full package of services. And then finally, four non-ENGINE war raters uh, continued in growth through nutrition were not part of either ENGINE or growth through nutrition. Next slide, please. And so as we look at getting back to, if you remember, the major nutrition problem identified under ENGINE was malnutrition. And what was very interesting about five years later, going back again to the same regions uh, to ask about major nutrition problems, the perception, there's a much more nuanced response. Uh, and if you look at the last column, column in totals, 94.4% now define the major nutrition problem as poor dietary diversity and an unbalanced diet. If you go about two thirds of the way down to malnutrition, again, defined the same way, 
a much lower percentage define malnutrition as the major problem. Now, let me be clear. Uh, this came up in focus group. Malnutrition was still seen as a problem, but it didn't jump to the head of the list as the major nutrition problem. And in addition to poor dietary diversity, we see again under totals, the low awareness misconception of nu what nutrition diversification meant as one of the other significant problems. So um, a mindset, a sea change in the perception of nutrition problems. Next slide, please. And uh, let's go to the last uh, row down there. Uh, we were interested in participation in the multi-sectoral uh, approach to nutrition. If you're not seen as participating, you're probably not gonna be very effective. Look at that last line there, not involved, not aware. Uh, what jumps out at me is not the negative that a third are not involved and not aware, but two thirds of the people involved in mo model war raiders two thirds are involved in one way or another. And again, I, I wouldn't claim the uh, Growth Through Nutrition Project could take full responsibility, but my perception given comments in the focus groups that's in the, the significant input from the uh, project from Save the Children, intensive technical assistance and package of services, model war raiders, Raiders were much more in, engaged in the actual implementation of multi-sectoral approaches, as opposed to the non-model war raiders or the non-engine war, war, war raiders. Next slide, please. And again, challenges in implementation, uh, different than what we saw in the engine project. Yes, lack of budget is coming up as a challenge, but at a much uh, lower level, and I think if we went back and asked people, would more money help? Of course, the answer would be yes. But in, in casting it in a wider context, it was not seen as a major challenge. And I, I highlight in red here going down to model war raiders and the non-engine war raiders, large numbers of committees were seen as a challenge. And I see that. And in fact, it was interpreted as things were happening. People were asked to participate in committees. There was actually a level of engagement. Next slide, please. Here, uh, nutritional focal person, again, getting back to the, the uh, at least the perception that the health sector was driving the multi-sectoral approach. What we see here is yes, of course, there is a focal point in 100% of the health offices, but what I find uh, a little bit more interesting, we find a focal point in the Wareta Water and Energy Office that wasn't there in the, our earlier research. And we find a specific focal point in the Wareta Agricultural Office. So again, one another signal that attention was being seriously devoted to research. Next slide, please. Uh, time spent in current position, and I, I constantly have to remind myself, this is not unique to Ethiopia. But often in, the, in these, in these uh, projects, interventions, there's tremendous turnout, turnover. And the reason I bring this up is I look at this and say, uh, even where we have been successful, and there's lots of indica indications that governance has become more responsive, even where that happens, there's a very um, small, uh, what I call tenurial status, time in position, roughly, round about a little bit more than two years. What's interesting here is the uh, time spent in current position, the, the largest average number of months comes in the uh, Wareta Finance Office. And I, I uh, 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 this is a joke uh, that what uh, my colleagues always say, well, if you control the purse, maybe you like what you're doing. I'm not sure that's a good interpretation, but there is turnover. So even where we've been successful with our technical assistance, we constantly have to refresh, rejuvenate kinds of capacity development and technical assistance. And my last slide, please. Um, oh, it isn't less the last. Uh, factors for improved collaboration. And this I found interesting, defining roles and responsibilities of sectors. It was very clear that participants in the multi-sectoral approach became better able to articulate what was needed for improved collaboration. And 
when we peel away what was meant by defining roles and responsibilities, what was meant there, and I don't take credit for this, but a person in the ministry at, at the Wolverine level, the equi equivalent of ministry of finance uh, in one of the meetings uh, as part of this research commented, and I've used this, this uh, term, we need to think multi-sectorally, but we act sectorally. And of course, a light bulb for me went off. The multi-sectoral approach, we, we have a good sense of what that means, but actual activities occur within sectors, budgets are allocated within sectors, and so when we're asking, for example, Ministry of Agriculture or related colleagues in agriculture to be more uh, nutrition responsive, there's a different menu of activities at that level than there is for say education and the specific contribution within the education sectors of what they are specifically doing. So really a menu of activities. May I have the next slide? And so in summary, um, sort of the, what I call the top line issues. Uh, I think we can continue to see from a whole series of significant populations, uh, publications rather, that the government of Ethiopia continues to make a commitment to nutrition. Uh, from a, a whole series of specific metrics, we do see progress in implementation. Um, and I haven't reported national level data, but we see it there. We see progress in implementation, but dot, 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 it takes time. Research can make a difference in the example I used, um, and it's just one of many, uh, the oversight uh, of the coordinating body in part because of our research, but a whole series of other discussions. The National uh, Nutrition Coordination Body, coordinating body was moved to the office of the prime minister. So a much more high visibility platform. Next slide and last slide. Uh, the investment in capacity can be a significant factor in helping implementation. And the example I've hi highlighted here is model war raiders, where there was very intensive level of intervention on capacity development, which uh, partners in that in, all, in each of the sectors saw as important, as valuable. And my last point in summary, investing in governance is a continual process. And again, we need to think about ways to continue rejuvenation, reinforcing mechanisms of governance. And a part of that is continue to keep a, gen, uh, a nutrition on the agenda, leadership, motivation, visibility. And I think if I'm not wrong, this, this leads very nicely into Dr. Gosha's presentation. Thank you. Um, it certainly does, Eileen. It a, was a fascinating presentation. Thank you. And I'm hoping that what I'm going to present on behalf, um, myself and Grace actually are going to present on behalf of our larger research team um, is, is going to complement what um, Dr. Kennedy has just presented. So um, thank you everybody for joining us from all over the world. And uh, we are going to be looking at the portion policy process studies, which was a series of assessments that were conducted uh, in Nepal, um, wherein where we wanted to understand the effective, sorry, could you go back please? One slide, um, effective governance for nutrition programs. Now you can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, so before I move in I, uh, into the presentation, I'd really like to thank our partners and collaborators, uh, particularly our partners on this research include Patan Academy of Health Sciences, Helen Keller International and the Valley Research Group. And we have to acknowledge uh, the government of Nepal, particularly the Ministry of Health and Population, the uh, NHRC, Nepal Health Research Council, the Institute of Medicine at Tripuvan University that have been very instrumental and supportive of our work, uh, USAID Nepal, as well as all the participants from the various line ministries from the national level down to the front line who, uh, who were very ready in responding to all our questions um, and surveys. Next slide, please. So I think Eileen has touched on this a lot. I think we all are in agreement that good governance is clearly needed. Uh, the question Eileen raised is what is the definition of good governance? Um, and um, basically we do need um, good governance to coordinate interventions, to have advocate investments, particularly in nutrition and set up accountability mechanisms. 
And there's broad agreement for any intervention to be successful at scale, you need to have an enabling policy environment. But a recent review of about 75 studies on the drivers of effective action by governments have found that the single um, issue related to inability to implement well-designed policies is linked to an absence of institutional ownership or institutional failures in implementing those policies. Um, so this sort of requires us to, as researchers who work in this space, think about what is it can we can do to support governments in making the right decisions as they move along the multi-sectoral pathway. The key issue for researchers is that governments are so heterogeneous that it's hard to study where do we start studying policy implementation and, and institutional governance, and it can be a difficult process. When we were designing this, both with Eileen and Ethiopia, where we kind of interacted across the two countries, as well as in Nepal, the key things we had to figure out was what do we want to precisely measure and where in the political and the civil service and arenas we should measure it. So it was a lot of discussion and thinking and interactions at, at the country level that led us uh, to the development of the survey tools that we used. Next slide, please. Let me, let me go a little bit into uh, the context of Nepal uh, and multi-sectoral interventions and coordination. For many of you may be familiar with this, Nepal uh, in Nepal, nutrition has been the cornerstone of development. And uh, particularly in the past decade, the Nepal Nutrition Assessment and Gap Analysis Naga, and I think it's more than 10 years at this point, really put multi-sectoral nutrition at the policy forefront. And this has been the, this has been, uh, the starting point for the uh, Nepal multi-sector nutrition plan, which is now considered as the guiding principle for several uh, multiple uh, multi-sectoral programs uh, being implemented through support by different bilateral agencies, including USAID, through UN agencies and the World Bank and others. Um, the government of Nepal is very invested in supporting multi-sectoral policies, particularly uh, for improving nutrition in women and children, particularly those under two years of age. Um, at this moment, the MSNP is in its second phase and it uh, goes through 2024. So within this policy context and within this environment, we at the Nutrition Innovation Lab uh, implemented what, what we call the portion policy process studies starting in 2013. Next slide, please. So what were the objectives? The objectives of our study uh, were basically to understand the process of implementation of multi-sectoral activities, uh, understand the barriers and facilitators and constraints in translating policy initiatives into actions at scale, but also to assess cross-sectoral coordination at and across different levels of governance, uh, as well as assess vertical and horizontal coherence around nutrition. Um, and Particularly to answer the second objective, we had to uh, do sweeping surveys uh, of uh, gov government officials starting from the national level down to the lowest administrative unit, which is the ward level in Nepal. Next slide, please. So the study is a mixed method study design. And as I mentioned, we did a sweeping set of surveys from uh, starting with officials at the national level down to the ward across different line ministries and departments. Uh, the sampling for the survey was purposive because we were more interested in targeting the departments that were engaged and the officials within those departments. Um, and we utilized semi-structured uh, questionnaires um, for each of these um, surveys. Uh, now, just to give you an idea of how many surveys we did, we collected five rounds of data. These were annual surveys that were con con conducted starting in 2013 through 2019. So we were able to do five surveys, uh, five annual surveys. Four of those rounds of data were collected prior to the new structure of, the, of government in Nepal. And one was conducted in 2019 after the new federal system was, uh, was set up. For those of you who may not be familiar, uh, the, Nepal had a new constitution ratified and enforced in 2015. Uh, and subsequent to that, the entire administrative structure across all line ministries uh, down to the front line uh, had changed. And so we were, we were fortunate and were able to do one round of survey collection after the change had been implemented. Next slide, please. 
this is just to show you the map of Nepal and the, uh, the districts that we were, uh, we were conducting these surveys. Um, and uh, essentially we were across the country in 21 districts. And I'll come to how we selected those 21 districts in the next slide. But as you can see here, we were across the mountains, the hills and the Tarai, which are three very distinct agroecological uh, zones in Nepal, which have their own distinct um, cultures, their own distinct ecologies, and their own distinct issues related to uh, nutrition. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of how did we come up with the 21 districts? So now y'all might be familiar with the Poshan community study. This was a, C, a, a similar longitudinal study that was done by Johns Hopkins, but where we, they were looking at the community level uh, indicators and they were assessing change in nutrition status of women and children over time. Um, and the community uh, Poshan community studies was conducted in 21 VDCs, which is a administrative unit within the district uh, across in those same 21 districts that we conducted the portion policy studies. So our selection of those 21 districts was based upon the uh, stratified randomization uh, selection that was conducted by Johns Hopkins of those 21 uh, districts. Uh, at the bottom of the flow chart, you can see how uh, the, the different departments that we targeted at the district level and at the and, and at the administrative levels below the district. So the 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 governance structure in Nepal prior to the change was essentially the district, then there was a sub-district of which is called as Ilaka, followed by the VDC, and then lastly the ward. Um, so those were the uh, the the four the four levels that we looked at subnational and below. Um, and as you can see, we, we conducted interviews ranging from the local development office to the health sector, to agriculture, to social mobilization, to WASH among others. Next slide, please. This is just to show you another way on how we organized the data collection. On the left side, you see the data that was collected from 2013 to 2016 um, and the different levels um, of governance that we collected the data. And on the right side, you can see in 2019, the survey that we conducted was district, municipality, boards, and community. Now, the, for the purpose of this presentation, Grace and I are going to be looking only at data from the district down to the ward level. Next slide, please. Um, this is just to give you um, um, an idea of the sample size by survey round, and I just want you all to focus on the sub sub national. And you can see we we interviewed somewhere between 500 to 600 individuals overall in rounds one, two, four, and five. You can see in round three we have only 136. This was because Nepal suffered from a devastating earthquake, and we we would not we were not able to visit 13 districts within our sample, which were part of the which were affected by the earthquake. So we, we were able to continue the survey uh, in nine of the districts. Um, next slide, please. So let me just sort of pull, pull out some of these results that because we've collected a, a vast amount of data starting from 2016 through 2019. Uh, we didn't have data collection in 2017 and 2018 because of the changing federal system. But just trying to encaps encapsulate this into a series of results for you all within this webinar, I just wanted to highlight three points. One is uh, we did an analysis of commitment, capability, and collaboration. And for this, we used the data from 2013 to 2016. Two is we developed a novel metric called the nutrition governance metric where we use the data from the 2014 and the 2016 surveys. And three is we use this NGI or the nutrition governance index and assessed its relationship with nutrition outcomes, again, using the 2014, 2016 data. And um, for the purpose of the presentation, I will focus on the first bullet point and then hand over to Grace uh, Namirenbe, who will look at the second uh, two bullet points. And as I'm uh, going into the next point, I do want to make a correction. I thank you, Manoj Basial, for pointing out that the M MSNP2 goes through 2022, not 2024. My apologies. Um, so sorry, next slide, please. So let me just um, uh, jump into the three domains that we looked at first, commitment, capability, and collaboration. Next slide, please. Um, so first of all, with commitment, we define commitment in this context as willingness to act and adopt nutrition as a core professional responsibility and accept a personal role in implementing policies and programs. 
So within this context, we actually looked at three elements. One is, do respondents acknowledge nutrition as a priority? Are they willing to take on additional responsibilities in order to achieve nutrition outcomes? And do they want to be engaged in and consulted on nutrition policy issues? So these were the three elements uh, within our survey that we assessed to look at what was the level of commitment. Next slide, please. Um, and so for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to look only at the 2013 survey data, um, because what we find is that commitment is actually very high across the board, um, irrespective of survey year. So about 61% asserted that nutrition should be a more important policy priority, but, and, but nearly all, irrespective of level, uh, of governance or sector of governance wanted to be more involved in professional discussions about nutrition problems and planning appropriate solutions. The main difference around prioritizing nutrition um, at the local level we found was that um, the folks or the respondents from the livestock, agriculture, local development and health sectors had a lower response rate to that question compared to the education and the wash sectors. But I'd like to put a caveat there and say, in fact, the re responses were 70% and above. So the highest were about 90 and 95% of that sector said, yes, nutrition should be a priority, um, a policy priority. So we're not looking at significant differences between the sectors. We're looking at small differences, but they are distinctly there. Next slide, please. Um, the other thing that we looked at within commitment is that what would be needed to promote more commitment or continued commitment. So the one thing that came out in our interviews was that some respondents felt that it was important to distinguish what was genuine commitment and that genuine commitment would be difficult to secure without appropriate incentives. Other respondents felt that they, there should be a mandatory mechanism to ensure appropriate dedication of time and resources. And that was not necessarily inherently because an individual wouldn't uh, dedicate time or resources, but because there are competing priorities that maybe nutrition might fall into the wayside. And also we had respondents indicating that financial allowances, advocate capacity building and promotion of joint responsibility for common roles, goals could be incentives that would support um, the, the com support commitment of the individual towards nutrition. Now, what was very interesting was that 62% of the officials that were at the regional level, not at the district level, promoted monetary allowances. So the financial allowances and do uh, play a very, very big part um, in uh, towards commitment according to the higher level officials. The one thing that we did find distinctly different between the lower level uh, officials and the higher level officials and lower level, I mean, ILACA, VDC and, and ward onwards, and then the higher level are district and regional, were that service providers, particularly at the ward level, were less likely to agree with the proposition that field workers are sufficiently motivated to take on responsibilities relating to nutrition compared to higher level officials. Uh, next slide, please. Then looking at capability and collaboration. Capability uh, assesses the capacity to deliver policy and program actions. And I think we'll all agree that inadequate capacity is often cited as the major reason for program failure. Similarly, within the context of multi-sectorality, excuse me, collaboration is critical. And Eileen has uh, uh, outlined that as well. But it is noted to be an elusive goal as it requires di articulating diverse approaches and interests across different se sectors, across different ministries, and also non-governmental actors, whether they are um, whether they are UN agencies, whether they are bilateral agencies, whether they are local implementing partners, uh, NGOs, and the civil society. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this is a little bit of a busy diagram, but I just want to show you what we found uh, around capability and collaboration. So on the left side, what you're looking at is a spider diagram where we are looking at change in responses from 2014 to 2016 uh, at the ward level. This is irrespective of sector. And on the right side, what you can see is the change in responses at the district level. And what you see here is essentially there is a huge shift and I'm hoping you all can, I'm sure you can't see my, um, uh, uh, my um, cursor here, 
But what you see is that there is a huge shift on the left side where more respondents were saying that they were engaged in nutrition related discussions, were having more effective collaborations and felt that decisions were being made uh, based on technical evidence. But on where you can see where we have um, on the left diagram, we have three places where we've highlighted uh, what they felt was lacking was that their colleague, colleagues had advocate skills and training, that they had advocate skills and training, and most importantly, besides the capacity issue, despite effective, what they termed as effective collaboration, they still felt that there was insufficient sharing of information across sectors. And this seemed to start, this did not change between 2014 and 2016. The other thing that I'd like to point out is that fewer respondent respondents agreed that their roles and response, responsibilities around nutrition were clearly defined. So the, the number that responded that in 2014 was low and then it went down even further in 2016. Um, and on the district level, what you can see is that other than the issues related to capacity and the relate, issues related to information sharing, which would be considered as a form of collaboration, you find that uh, everything else is very different from the, the, the ward level. So this is a lot to unpackage in, these, in this slide here, but I just wanted to highlight the fact that, um, that this is all published in a paper and we're gonna give you um, the, uh, the paper uh, references at the end of this webinar. On that note, I think on the next slide, I'm going to pass this over to Grace and I will come back with the concluding remarks. Thank you. Ah, thank you, Shibani. Uh, so I'm now going to talk about a recently developed metric called the Nutrition Governance Index. I will briefly touch on its relevance and application in the context of Nepal. Uh, next, slide, next slide, please. Um, there's a need for countries to translate their policies into measurable outcomes. However, there are very few metrics that are developed to achieve this. And some of these include, uh, some of these are the Political Commitment Rapid Assessment Tool, and the Hunger and Nutrition Commitment Index. Um, these tools are aggregate scores um, at the national level, so they cannot be used um, to assess uh, subnational uh, groups or uh, things like sectors, uh, ministries. Um, so they, and, and the other issue is they may not be nutrition specific. So we developed a tool that can address these issues in addition to assessing um, the readiness to implement nutrition policies. Uh, next, please. Uh, so these are some of the concepts that are captured by the Nutrition Governance Index. They uh, were obtained based on published literature about the key factors that are relevant to nutrition governance. Um, understanding of nutrition and related policies, uh, formal consideration of nutrition in national budgets. Uh, it's important to have a clear definition um, of nutrition related responsibilities, uh, clear leadership, do they have an advocate for nutrition related issues? Um, on the job training is quite important and of course availability of financial and uh, non-financial support. Next slide please. So we then condensed all of these responses into principal components uh, using a statistical technique uh, called Principal Components Analysis, or PCA. Uh, these components capture most of the variation in the data uh, and they're weighted by this variation and finally aggregated into a single score. We validated uh, the final score by assessing its reliability and construct validity uh, in order to determine the extent to which all of the questions are measuring the same traits and to also confirm the relationship between the questions um, and the retained components. Uh, next slide, please. And as a result, um, we identified six different domains that were aggregated into a single score uh, that we have now named the Nutrition Governance Index, or in brief, the NGI. Uh, it has been normalized to range from zero to 100 so that it's easy uh, to interpret and uh, it should be very intuitive to use. Uh, these are understanding nutrition and responsibilities, uh, collaboration within and across offices, access to financial resources, nutrition leadership, capacity, 
and coordination and support. Um, next slide. Right, so then we used uh, the 2014 and 2016 data to demonstrate uh, application of the NGI over time. And we can see that there was overall improvement in nutrition governance across all of these subnational groups as evidenced by the red line um, being on top of the blue lines. So the red line is uh, data for 2016 and the blue line is for 2014. Um, we can see that the health ministry relative to the non-health ministries scored highly both cross-sectionally and across time. And um, you can see also uh, officials who are trained on the job performed much better than those who were not. And in 2016, the longer the duration of employment, the more effective they were in their governance. Um, but this is just an example of its application. Um, but the NGI can be extended to other subnational groups. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in another application, we hypothesized that the NGI is associated with nutrition outcomes in children. Um, and once again, we explored this relationship in Nepal. Next slide, please. Um, we employed two modeling approaches to explore and confirm this relationship. Uh, given the study design, if you recall from Shibani's presentation, um, there is a design effect to account uh, for in this relationship. Uh, so the GEE model provides robust estimates of the variances of regression coefficients, uh, while also adjusting for known factors that are associated with nutrition outcomes. And um, the multi-level model approach uh, enabled us to estimate variances at each level. Uh, we had two uh, different levels, the individual level, which had the child level factors and uh, the VDC level at which point nutrition governance um, exerted it effect, its effects on, on children. Uh, next slide, please. So we see that in both models, we found that these are uh, a positive and significant association, um, we found that the mo more effective nutrition governance is protective of stunting in older children compared to younger children. And in the multi-level model, it was significantly associated with better um, weight for height Z scores, but this relationship was not significant in the GEE model. Um, next. We are probably seeing this effect in, uh, no, one point back, please. Oh, yeah. We're probably seeing this effect in older children because policy actions rolled out in Nepal were more likely to improve nutrition sensitive pathways, which generally benefit older children. Uh, and nutrition specific uh, interventions are usually designed to affect pregnancy and immediate uh, post-pregnancy outcomes. Um, the other reason, of course, could be uh, the lag defects that we are capturing as older children have more exposure to existing policies uh, than younger children. All right, next, please. So a few points to consider when using the NGI. In order to get a comprehensive understanding of nutrition governance, it's important to assess performance based on the overall scope um, in addition to the domains as well. If you recall, uh, we identified six domains. It's important to know uh, how, let's say, a ministry performs on each of those domains because uh, an overall high performance in the NGI does not necessarily mean uh, a high performance on all of the different domains. Uh, the other issue is we were agnostic to individual changes within positions, uh, which may create some noise in the quality of responses but these changes were not significant. Um, and again, uh, uh, individuals were selected purposively uh, within uh, districts. So the nature of the study design may limit generalizability of results beyond our sample, uh, which makes it all the more important to test the NGI in other contexts. All right, next please. So in summary, uh, measuring the effectiveness of policy implementation at the subnational level is feasible 
using a simple and intuitive tool like the MGI. Uh, the Nutrition Governance Index can be linked to nutrition outcomes and can be contextualized for use in other countries. Um, I will now introduce Shibani to conclude this presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Grace, very much. And can we have the next slide, please? Um, so thank you, everybody. And I've I'm, I'm, uh, been reading the chats and the hopefully got some of the Q&As answered, but I'm hoping we can have a, a good discussion after I finish the conclusion on this presentation. Um, I think one of the things that we have um, realized uh, in, uh, starting off on this journey, as well as as we're going through it, is that you know implementing multi-sectoral policies have major complexities associated with them. You need a high level of quality and performance and coordination and convergence. And all this, um, if you will, is hard when you're dealing with uh, varying types of management, when you're dealing with varying types of technical capacity and, and governance environments. And what's even more critical is that what might be um, terminology that is normal in one sector might be very different from the other sector. So it's a it's a very challenging um, approach that uh, that that has to be implemented if we want to achieve nutrition. So that's really the environment that we are working in, which makes it very hard in terms of trying to sort of say, okay, what works and what doesn't work. So the next slide, please. Um, and what we found, and very similar, I think this is very similar to what Eileen has also reported in Ethiopia, that there is movement happening. We are seeing the implementation of the MSNP policy moving ahead in Nepal in the forward direction. And in our surveys, we do find strong commitment and a positive shift in capability and uh, collaboration, particularly at the lower levels of governance, because that's the front line. That's where you need to see um, shifts happening in the sectors. Um, but you do definitely see a need for more committed resources for nutrition, training, information sharing. And one critical thing that came up in, in as we were reviewing the analyses is that there was this call for a need for clarity over a division of labor roles and responsibilities uh, within the multi-sectoral plans. And that was something that came out very, very clearly to us. Um, and, and so I think I think these are all the elements of what the civil society and what government officials are telling us is going to allow them to do better with multi-sectoral policies. Um, and finally, I'd like to say that I know that there are and there has been some chatter about the different types of tools existing um, for governance assessments. And we think that we're trying to generate something that's a little bit more novel. It allows us to measure the quality of the policy implementation, but it also allows us to assess constraints and opportunities, not just at the national level, but also the subnational level. Critical to that subnational part is we're looking at the front line and we're doing an assessment across the entire um, uh, across the entire uh, pathway, if you will, from the national level down to the front line. Um, so that's and 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 we're doing this not just individual sector by sector. We are assessing it across all sectors. So we we think that this is an interesting tool and approach to utilize. We are very open for uh, collaborations, and we are more than happy to share the tool. As I know, Eileen has also mentioned in uh, in her uh, chat that she is more than happy to share the tool. Um, and you know, obviously, there is country contextualization needed. In fact, we are working with colleagues in Lao right now in contextualizing this tool towards um, potentially doing some assessments in Lao. Uh, so please feel free to reach out to us and, and these, these tools are readily available uh, and accessible and usable. Um, next slide, please. Um, these are just uh, these are the publications on the Nepal end that uh, will be are all available on our website, as are the Ethiopia publications that Eileen's um, already uh, made reference to. So please feel free to uh, visit our website and you, you'll find these available for download. The third paper is under review right now, so you may not find it, but we just wanted to make sure you knew that that was underway. And last slide, please. Um, and these are some references that we have utilized in, in, in our presentation and as well as in the manuscripts, which might be of use for uh, some of you who are planning and thinking about um, assessing uh, governance for nutrition. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna hand this over back to Robin. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Sibani, uh, Grace, and Eileen. Uh, 
lots of synergies in terms of uh, the findings in the two countries, like, you know, in terms of governance, you know, for effective implementation of the policies, there's, there's a increased demand in understanding the roles and responsibilities, also increased capacity and access to uh, financial and non-financial resources. So thank you for presenting that. And with that, uh, we will now open the floor to questions. And uh, we already have a lot of questions. And, and thank you, Eileen Sibani, uh, for answering some of them in the, in the chat box. Uh, and some of these might be worth to bring in uh, for the discussion to a larger uh, group here. So what I'll do is uh, I'll start with Eileen. Uh, this is a question from Carrie. Uh, yeah, and, and she says, in, in some of your slide, the agriculture sector was not shown where they part of the economic sector. And along that line, if you can also clarify, I know you've already done that in the, in the chat box, but who uh, the partners are uh, in, your, in, your, in your industry sector, what, which, which group do they represent? Yeah, thanks, Robert. Yeah, the agricultural sector was included in the economics uh, sector, and that was actually at the suggestion of our government collaborators because they see uh, still agriculture contributing uh, a quite significant amount to national GDP. Partners included uh, donors, um, uh, international agencies, international as well as national NGOs. Great, thank you. Uh, Sibani, this is a question from Prava. Uh, so since social protection play a major part in, in nutrition sensitive actions in terms of diet quality and diversity and food security, from a multi-sectoral aspect, what specific change did you see or did you look at around social welfare investments in Nepal? And if you can, what are those, if you can explain what are those, some of those key drivers of changes? Uh, right, thank you. Um, so I think to clarify uh, with Prava, uh, which I, I think I did put in the chat message, is that um, we were not assessing change in investments over time. I do believe that colleagues from USAID Spring um, have done some kind of investment assessments at the national level and how those have changed over time. Um, so in this particular study, we didn't look at changing investments. I do also know that USAID Suwahara in Nepal had done some local district level investment mapping to sort of say, okay, what kind of resources are going to which activities? I could be wrong, but I, I would sort of um, direct Prava towards looking into that. In terms of uh, social protection, it absolutely plays a major part. And I believe, and I, I there are other colleagues on this um, session who might be more uh, familiar with MSNP, but that does part an integral part of MSNP, particularly in areas where there are going to be high levels of food insecurity and poverty. Um, so I'm, I'm sure I'm not answering the question, but I hope this helps. Yes, uh, thank you, Sibani. And uh, I'll move on to Grace. So Grace, uh, did you measure access to government services or schemes or other financial services, or can NGI be able to measure that? Um, so access to government services. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we created the the NGI, we had a, a wide list of questions um, to work from, and the twenty four that we ended up with uh, were after an iterative process, um, and they were all condensed into these uh, much smaller domains. Uh, so the dom domains that we remained with uh, may not have captured uh, all of the different um, concepts that we had. So that could have been access uh, to, uh, to government services. Um, um, no financial resources were captured, but the point is uh, the final list of questions could have eliminated some of the questions that we asked because they had to be, uh, the NGI had to be based on uh, questions that were relevant to the retained components. Uh, but yes, we do have uh, different questionnaires for this. One is an exhaustive list based on, of course, literature reviews. Uh, and this also goes to answer Sarah Edelati. Um, we did ask um, uh, all the officials uh, quite a number of questions 
but in the statistical process, we had to eliminate some of them to make it more relevant um, to the domains, to the factors, uh, all the components retained. Um, and of course, in um, other applications or in other contexts, we could build onto these questions um, to get more domains, but statistically, we couldn't come up with all the different um, factors that are associated with governance. I hope that answers you, your question. Thank you, Grace. Uh, this is a question from Sasa, and maybe I'll, ask, I'll request all the panelists to, to say their thoughts. Uh, this is about what aspects or factors of governance do you think or have you found from your studies are, 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 are most important for improving uh, nutrition services and our outcomes? Maybe we can start with Eileen. Yeah, uh, in a very complex situation, this is, believe it or not, easy for me to answer. Um, if we look at success stories, there are, three, there are three factors I see across success stories, whether we're talking about success at the national level or subnational level, leadership, motivation, and uh, commitment. And if I could use two examples, um, the first one, Malawi, where I was working years ago, um, former president, Dr. Banda, was were given some data indicating a very low percentage of um, children in the country were immunized he decided this was unacceptable and goal every child immunized and in, almost in a nanosecond that number went from a baseline that was pathetic to over 90 percent of the children now that kind of draconian measure you you don't often get um but it, it's a, a question of commitment and leadership and uh where that doesn't exist i think there there are ways of generating it and let me just because uh, i don't want to just be specific specific context specific but there are some rules I think that rise to the top. The um, very effective zero hunger movement in Brazil, uh, people often equate with the president or the prior president, uh, Graziano, but it actually started at the community level. Uh, a national NGO had the equivalent of a zero hunger program. It was so um, effective uh, at the local level and politically uh, seen as advantageous, it was adopted at the, uh, the national level. So that, that leadership and motivation comes in many forms. And I think yeah, key, the key issue there is where you don't have leadership motivation and commitment, what are ways that you can generate that? Yeah, I think Robin, I would say that I think Eileen has encapsulated it and said it just exactly how it is. In in I, I would just add that I think it's, you know, you can have leadership and motivation and commitment at the at the national level. It needs to percolate downwards and that we need to understand what are the constraints at the bottom so that, you know, that in fact all the the sort of goodwill that goes in at the higher levels does actually translate into actions. That, that's the only thing I would add, but I think Eileen has put it very nicely. Yeah. Reese, anything to add? Um, Robin, please ask the question again. So uh, what aspects of governance uh, from, from the, the two studies uh, have you found are most important for improving yeah, that's a good question. I would say um, collaboration uh, across time, collaboration, collaborating within offices and across offices has proved to be very effective. And it, that goes to show you the importance of multi-sectoral um, interventions uh, because it's not just um, the, let's say the health ministry that, that, that that's interested in uh, improving child nutrition outcomes, uh, the non-health ministries to uh, have something to contribute. So I would say out of all the six domains that I've analyzed, collaboration, um, I would weight it um, higher than the others. So Sibani, this is a question from uh, Uma. Do you have uh, impression that the multi-sector nutrition plan is sufficient to address nutrition issues in Nepal? And, and do you think you know, it has to be strengthened or some more, more policy shift is, is needed to improve the current nutrition scenario in Nepal? So yeah, thank you, um, Dr. Kurala. That's a very, very good question. 
I, I think the key thing is MSNP is a very comprehensive strategy. Um, and it is, you know, I, I feel like it, it was a huge undertaking taking by the government of Nepal, by all the sort of stakeholders in Nepal in, in putting this together. So I, I, I do think it's very comprehensive. Does it need to be, does there need to be a shift? I think Eileen made that comment about the fact that, you know, policy um, implementation and action and is a continuous process and it's a continual process and it needs to have a feedback. So does it need to be completely changed? I don't think I can answer that question, but should it be dynamic? It should be dynamic. So do you want to scratch out the policy and, and do something else? I would say no, but you <laughs> probably want to have feedback into the policy process so that you can actually have dynamic changes and continuous progress. Um, so that would be my answer for Dr. Kerala. Can I, uh, Robin, is it possible for me to add to that? Totally agree, it's possible, Robin? Oh, sure. He's good. I totally agree with what um, uh, Shabani has just said, said, and Shabani, you and I usually agree. That may be scary, but anyway, um, we sometimes think about, um, let's take the multi-sectoral approach as a freestanding or delinked from everything else. I mean, while, while these uh, multi-sectoral approaches are taking place in many countries, there, there are other policies that are equally important. For example, policies related to, let's take sustainable development goal one, um, elimination of poverty. And in Ethiopia, there's a very specific strategy for economic growth. The reason I bring this up is we don't sometimes think about that uh, economic growth national related to multi-sectoral, but in order to fund a wide range of services in the country, you need national income. So um, complex issues, and we, we could have spent two days thinking about, well, how, how do you, uh, I like your diagram, Shabani, your, your web diagram with everything in it, but how do we, how do we uh, fit the multi-sectoral approach for nutrition into a broader web where you have you have health policies, education policies, transportation policies, national eco economic growth policies, and they're all linked. Yeah. Very good point, I mean, actually. Right. So this is again a question for all panelists from Ahmed. Uh, are there any lessons that could be extracted from these two country studies that can be taken as a general broad recommendations for other countries to improve governance around nutrition? Uh, yeah, uh, we, that I think Eileen would require. It's a bigger response eventually. Yes, uh, um, that we'll reach out to. But I think, in an immediate nutshell, I feel like we have um, developed a tool and a series of uh, and, and an approach that I think would be interesting um, to apply in other countries. Um, in terms of lessons learned, pulling out into case studies, uh, I'm looking at Eileen and saying, you know, Eileen, we should um, definitely talk about this, but I'll pass it on to you. Yep, yep. Great. So, uh, yeah, I have another question about, you know, what, what your thoughts are, and this is again for, for all panelists here, all three of you, how does the, the, the current metric and approach of measurement that we've just discussed this in this webinar, it contributes or supports or even complement to the, the metrics that's already out there around governance uh, at, at both at the national and subnational level. Uh, so, you know, do you mind sharing your thoughts on that? Well, I don't know, Shabani, you want to go first or you want me to go first? Um, it's up to you, Eileen. All right, I, uh, I think what you see, and um, so we talked today about Ethiopia and Nepal, uh, uh, Nutrition Innovation Lab also has done extensive work uh, in Uganda, Shabani, Patrick Webb, myself. Uh, and the reason I'm bringing this up is um, documents like the WHO 2013 document are very valuable uh, because I think they, they kind of set the, the conceptual theoretical framework but one needs the reality of what my colleagues call boots on the ground to think about uh, what is important. What is important and can be generalized across all countries, uh, sort of uh, core variables, and they, that group of core variables may be very small, versus context specific variables. And I think it's only as we, we get to see uh, in actual implementation what's important. Um, 
do we have a better understanding how to refine some of our measures? Um, we didn't talk about as a label today, political economy issues, but uh, I'll send a, a paper, Robin, if you don't mind, that was in uh, Global Food Security 2020 with colleagues from FAO, where we looked at uh, 24 priority countries for FAO, all regions of the world. And one takeaway lesson in political economy issues, things like commitment, leadership, capacity, vested interest, corruption. Uh, and I was surprised that in these country developed by government reports, they actually talked about the problems of corruption. But it's a politi the, the from these 24 countries, one of the takeaway messages was um, uh, political economy issues can swamp any of the, the technical implementation issues. You really need the leadership and implementation um, and the, so the issue for us is um, because changes in political structure over time, I, I rarely use a um, US example because it's typically not very relevant, but I'm gonna disobey my rule. Uh, under the prior administration, um, there was a, a walk away from the Paris Accords on climate change. One of the first um, activities of the current administration, the Biden administration was to rejoin the, the Paris Accords. That, that is in the bucket of political economy issues. What are the priorities for the country? It has enormous implications for everything, but in, including uh, mitigating climate change in agriculture, which of course is one of the engines that drives a lot of these countries. So that's a long-winded uh, way, but I think we have to begin to, and Shabani, I, I, you know, I'd like to work with you on, we can do this, we can do this comparison of Uganda, Nepal, and uh, Ethiopia on some issues we've left out, but, uh, I think there are core variables that transcend countries, but then the reality is there are some context specific issues. Yeah, thank you, Eileen. That, that was exactly what I was going to add on. And I, I think, yes, there might be sort of conceptual frameworks and conceptual tools that allow us to look at national and subnational level. I think what we've managed to do with Ethiopia and Nepal with this these tools is that we've been able to go across so we are not just looking at sort of horizontal coordination across sectors at a certain level. We're looking at both horizontal and vertical um, coherence, if you will. That would be the term to use. Um, I also think that, you know, we, we keep saying yeah, there are lots of tools. Actually, we have very little data collected around this topic. When we first started working on this, we, we had to go and there was absolutely, there were lots of guides and lots of information out there, theoretical but there was absolutely zero data for us to sort of, whether it was Ethiopia, Nepal, or Uganda, to make some kind of a statement on, on what does, what, what does, what needs to happen on the ground for a policy to be effective. And I think that that's really, so I, I would say for folks that this is just one, maybe one of many tools, but I have to tell you boots on the ground, as Eileen said, data, 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 data is going to drive decision making and it should drive decision making even within the context of us understanding how governance can support nutrition. I also know that there are some comments on how do you define good governance. I think we need the data for that as well. And Eileen already said, you know, the good governance can be very relative to people. But the fact of the matter is, if we want, we are able to look at this data the way Grace has looked at it, she's been able to identify, she was quick in saying, the one factor that emerged out in this statistical analysis was collaboration. So I think that that's where I would say that I agreed there's a lot there, but we need data. I'll pass it on over to Grace if she wants to add anything to this. Um, I think um, Shivani and Eileen have exhausted uh, uh, what I was thinking. Uh, so I have nothing more to add. Um, other than um, to, again, um, emphasize that it's important to rely on data. Um, it's important to know if there's progress or where there are gaps um, in, in policy implementation. Uh, so you can't write policies um, and operate them in a vacuum. Uh, so I think this tool is bridging a really important uh, large gap. So. Thank you. Robin, can I, can I, can I add one more? Because I think we were, I, I talked about the four, four factors or variables that could maybe transcend country. And um, let me use this example. And I, I would like Shabani to jump in and see if she agrees. But uh, 
the three countries where we've, we've done, uh, I think the most work in, in kind of maybe some new thinking on this are Nepal, Ethiopia, and Uganda. And uh, for me, one of the issues is the, the level at which um, um, oversight, leadership, whatever term you want to use, uh, is provided for these multi sectoral approaches. And uh, in Ethiopia, it was seen as a real positive to have this rise to the level of the prime minister. In Uganda, we haven't talked about, but the uh, multi sectoral plan was developed by one group, but when it actually got implemented, the oversight came out of, of the, again, the office of the prime minister in Uganda. Very, very important. And the first time in Nepal, I attended at the national level at Kathmandu, a, their equivalent of the coordinating body. It was chaired by the Minister of Finance, not Health, not Agriculture. And so I think you need to look at platforms where, we kind of, where you decompose this issue of leadership, commitment, collaboration, and look at, well, what's the best bully pulpit for that? But a general rule of thumb I would say is, and this is not just at the national level, if you can find what I call a charismatic personality, someone who's passionate, committed, and has some clout, that, that, and again, at all levels, national, subnational, very, very important. That's a great point. Yep. Thank you, Arjun. Uh, there's one quick question for Sibani and, and Grace. Uh, from, from Saren, uh, how well do studies in Nepal that include the districts now apply to the new federal structure that is in place? Uh, is it all lost or what can be in for uh, So maybe Sibani, we can start with you and Grace can chime in. Sure, yeah, and I was literally just typing a response to Sharon's question as I'm like scrolling and making sure we don't miss out any questions. So yeah, Sharon, thank you. Yes, this was something that, um, you know, after 2015, um, you know, we realized that we couldn't actually continue. We did a 2016 survey um, on the ground because the structure was still in place. It was, a, you know, as you will be aware that it took about a year and a half, almost two years for the system to change um, in Nepal. And so I think what we did have was a 2016, which was the old system. And then we don't have data on 2017 and 2018, which is the new. I believe it was a little bit to do with the fact that many of the officials were not in their positions in the new structures. Um, and so we were able to then go back in 2019. So we'll be able to compare um, the rounds of data to see, you know, to what extent, you know, have there been shifts in this sort of analysis or commitment, um, in commitment, capability, or collaboration. Uh, in terms of the NGI, maybe I'll hand it over to Grace and say, how could we use the 2019 data for the NGI? Grace, over to you. Uh, yes, so we can definitely use uh, that 2019 um, data for creating the NGI, um, but there will be caveats. I, and this is up for discussion, um, but I think it's best to use the 2019 data as a baseline um, and maybe compare with previous uh, time points with a few caveats. But um, moving forward, it's best to compare 2019 to, new, uh, to newer studies um, basing on the new um, structure. So we do have a baseline for 2019 for sure. And we have created the NGI for 2019, but we're um, just working on the caveats necessary uh, in, the in the comparison to previous rounds. Robin, can I add one more thing there? As, as I hear my colleagues talking, a, a million thoughts occur to me, but the, the, the development agenda in many countries is being uh, by the Sustainable Development Goals. And I think we have to remind ourselves that there can be competition between SDGs, which is a priority. And let me use a very simple example. A lot of what we've talked about today in Nepal and Ethiopia may be nested under Sustainable Development Goal 2, you know, eliminate uh, no food insecurity, eliminate malnutrition in all its forms, sustainable agriculture. But for a lot of countries, Sustainable Development Goal 1, no poverty, um, is higher on the agenda. And so uh, getting back to what gets implemented, you need to think about across the continuum of priorities of the government, how do you continue to elevate health and nutrition in the agenda, but realizing that uh, government has multiple priorities, adding to Shabani's point, these issues are complex. Right. And 
yeah, that, that's a good way to bring this all to, to close because we have, we still have a lot of questions, but unfortunately we <laughs> get through all of them. But what I will ask all our three panelists is to share maybe like one key takeaway message as, as we advance our understanding uh, on governance around nutrition. And uh, maybe we can start with Grace and then on to Sibani and then Eileen. Sure. Um, sure. Uh, so everything has been said, but I just want to add uh, one thing. Um, these metrics are, they have great potential for um, increasing transparency, government transparency uh, and accountability. Uh, so we, def we definitely would vouch for their uh, continued use um, in different contexts, not just in Nepal. Me next, yeah, I, I have to say thank you. I've been looking at, I realized, Robin, there was things in the chat <laughs> box that we haven't captured. So I'd like to say that for us, this is just, I, I feel this is, this is one piece of the puzzle. There are obviously other efforts going on, whether it's in Nepal or Ethiopia. Um, and, you know, we try to converge and coordinate as much as possible at the national level. Um, and, and that this, you know, our webinar is one way that we can share our findings and, and uh, bring it to all of you. And I appreciate all the comments and, and, and questions. And I hope that we can continue working in the space, bringing data where it's needed, that is to the policymakers to make the right decisions. So over to you, Eileen. Oh, bingo, Shivani. I wasn't gonna say that, but bingo, evidence-based policy, that would be wonderful. What I was gonna say, and I will, is that uh, sometimes uh, individuals involved in development, you, you get a little bit jaundice. Uh, oh, you know, are we really making progress? And again, I think if you look at it in the long term, we are making progress. Globally, uh, malnutrition has decreased, whether one is talking about stunting or, or micronutrient deficiencies, still a problem, but we see progress. And I think part of it uh, is, okay, what has contributed to that progress? And it's a multi-dimensional answer to that. But uh, uh, for us in, in policy and us in research, don't get discouraged. You need to look at these issues with a longer term perspective and just keep on and out, and keep on using and providing evidence-based policy. Thank you, Eileen, Sibani, and Chris uh, for that thought. Uh, we have taken an extra two minutes and I apologize for that, but, but this has been an engaging and vibrant webinar. And on behalf of the Nutrition Innovation Lab, I thank all the 260 to 70 participants we have had for you know, participating and listening in today. Uh, stay safe and thank you. Thank you, Robin everybody. Thank you everyone for joining.